Yes, good morning. Well, this is a, a wonderful start of last 10 because I see that really most of the seats are filled already. So actually this uh, Freudian slip with 10 p.m. We are going to, to take probably longer than 10 p.m. tonight because uh, at least at 9 p.m. A reception is scheduled and I hope that by that time you will all still be um, very active and happy and um, going. So the next 13 hours or so will be dedicated to last 10 as will be the next few days. So a very warm welcome to all of you and especially to our well, speaker of this morning you can't imagine what this poor man went through in order to be here with you today. Uh, he might hint at it at some stage. Um, Father Akbon Kianmeke, is that correct. the correct pronunciation? It's um, really difficult to pronounce that name, Orobator, who actually also answers to the name of Bator, I think. Um, he is a Jesuit and is currently, if I'm not mistaken, on a sabbatical, right, in Marquette University in Milwaukee. Um, he is also the principal of Hekima College Jesuit School of Theology in Nairobi, in Kenya. Till last year, he was as the provincial for the East African countries, the spiritual and community leader of Jesuits in six African countries, namely Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania, South Sudan, and North Sudan. Um, he comes originally from Nigeria. He received his PhD in theology and religious studies from the University of Leeds in England. Tell me if I'm telling lies. Um, because sometimes you can't really rely on what's there in, on the internet. Mm -hmm. And he teaches theology and religious studies at Hekima College Jesuit School of Theology and Institute of Peace Studies in Nairobi, Kenya. He is reported to be one of the most important theological voices in all of Africa. You will soon hear that he is a steering speaker and especially known for his writings in the area of social analysis and ethics and for his reading of the Christian dogmatic tradition in the distinctive light of African religious experience. In his book, Theology Brewed in an African Pot, if you want to buy it, it's all his books and came out in 2008, he examines such core doctrines, core Christian themes as God, Trinity, creation, grace, and sin, Jesus Christ, Mary, the saints, as well as the meaning of theology itself, with extraordinary depth, nuance, faithfulness to the tradition, and skill at rendering faith credible today. Furthermore, he has written or co-written numerous books on topics including church as family, quite topical these days, Catholic social teaching and social justice. He is an advisory board member for the Jesuit Refugee Service and a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Religion in Africa. And today he'll speak to us on a topic that's interesting for all of us, why theology still matters, the story of Mama Frankie. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Maya. And good morning. I will be telling the story. And um, for now, it will, it will not be the story of how I got to come to Louvain. That will save for another conference. Um, in the last conference program, that we all have, the purpose of our gathering this morning is to listen to a presentation that is part of the opening formalities of uh, the Junior Scholars Conference. And I have to admit, I have not inquired into the criterion for making the distinction 
between the junior uh, scholars and I presume the, the senior scholars. <laughs> Each and all, Professor Anna Marie uh, Maya, my aim this morning in all sincerity and humility is to offer some words of encouragement, uh, take it from one colleague to another. I think, um, as I will suggest later on, the vocation of the theologian is a shared vocation, it's a shared mission. And um, we can appropriately apply the words of scripture that the greatest really is the one who serves the others. So I would like to begin with a story. I grew up telling stories, and I still uh, appreciate the role of storytelling in theological research and scholarship. It's the story of Mama Frankie, not her real name, of course. In December 2007, Kenya organized a hotly contested parliamentary and presidential elections. As I said, it was a bitterly contested election, and it ended up in widespread chaos and violence. Over the course of three months, the ensuing mayhem would claim the lives of no fewer than 1,600 children, women, and men, and displace another 3,000 Kenyans across the country. And these were days of utter turmoil and darkness that descended on and engulfed the entire Kenyan society. At the time, as rector of Hekima College and superior of the Jesuit community of close to 75 students and faculty members, my immediate concern was the safety and security of the people entrusted to my care. But as I recall, we did more than just try to stay safe. Hakima College organized a campaign for the return of peace with justice. And the idea was a simple one. We decided to print the prayer of peace attributed to Francis of Assisi and distribute this widely across Kenya. The goal of this exercise was to focus the attention of the nation on reconciliation, justice, and peace beyond the mindless violence, the ethnic bigotry, and the sectarian divide. One day, however, in the heat of the violent conflict, I decided to do the one thing that I believe I do best. On invitation, I decided to write about the crisis in order to give a perspective for a global audience on the situation in Kenya. I wrote a piece for a theological magazine. And in that essay, I narrated the story of a Kenyan mother of 11 children Mama Frankie. They had humble dwellings in one of the informal settlements or slums that surround the city of Kenya, like uh, the infamous wall of Jericho, segregating the poor from the rich. During the crisis, Mama Frankie was displaced with her children. And she didn't know where all of her children were at the time. And in my article for this theological magazine, I made the case that Mama Frankie, rather than the political antagonists, were the real victims of this situation of instability and violence. 
I did not make much of the article once it was published. But about six months later, I received a letter from an 80-year-old man who lived in the United States of America. And in that handwritten letter, he mentioned that he had read my article and was deeply moved by the story and predicament of Mama Frankie. And he continued that after much reflection, he had come to the conclusion that until his dying day, he will send 50 US dollars every month to Mama Frankie and would die accept the invitation to receive this money and pass it on to her every month. Of course, I agreed I would do it. And this man kept his promise until his dying day. And God rest his soul. Mama Frankie, come to think of it, cannot spell the word theology. She cannot spell theology. She never went to school, never received an education. And like most women on the continent of Africa, she is functionally and theologically illiterate. If I gave her a copy of my article, she wouldn't know what to make of it or do with it, except for art, except perhaps to use it to wrap the ground nuts or the maize calves that she sells in a roadside kiosk. But I like to think that a theological essay of 1,200 words made a positive difference in her life, in the life of this woman. Thanks to this monthly donation, Mama Frankie was able to build a bigger kiosk and even set up a mini restaurant, which she now runs with the help of some of our children. I chose to tell this story for three principal reasons. First of all, it is common to inquire about the utility of the discipline of theology. To what purposes our argumentations, our theses, our discourses? Or to put it differently, what is the job description of a theologian? Why do we do the things that we do and the way that we do them? And these, I believe, are valid questions that every theologian, emerging or established, young or old, new or seasoned, junior or senior, must continue to grapple with and to reflect upon. And although we have many, many descriptions of the vocation of the theologian to varying degrees of satisfaction and clarity, I believe that everybody in this room today would have his or her reason for studying theology. For my part, and I speak for myself alone, I would prefer to see theological research and scholarship essentially a service, service of faith and service of the community called church. I would prefer to see that this discipline attempts to understand the fundamental nature and mission of the Christian community and the ongoing unfolding relevance of the faith for life lived in the quotidian. As theologians, I believe it falls to us to engage Christian faith constructively amidst the mysteries and, and, and ambiguities, the challenges and complexities of life. And here's the second reason for telling the story of Mama Frankie. It concerns the sources 
of our theological scholarship and research. The Second Vatican Council, whose anniversary we gather to celebrate here at Leuven, teaches us, and especially in Dei Verbum, that scripture, tradition, and the magisterium are key sources and enablers of a valid Christian theology. And that claim is beyond question. I presume that many theologians would accept that as, as axiomatic. Yet I believe, as I said, that theology is about the faith of the people of God. And that as theologians, we may not limit our research and scholarship exclusively to these sources. In today's fast-paced, globalizing, and technologically sophisticated world, the issues that we contend with and must constantly reflect upon, I believe, have not been provided for sufficiently or exhausted entirely by these sources. And let me be clear, I do not make this assertion to offend the sensibility of anyone in the room who probably believes that scripture covered every human activity and endeavor, including tennis, because <laughs> because it is said that uh, Joseph served in Pharaoh's court, <laughs> or, or as some would say, that Jesus coming down from the Mount Tabor prohibited television when he said to his disciples, television to no one. <laughs> That's not my point. That is not my point. Even Dei Verbum concedes that the word of God grows grows. This word is not an indelible letter on the pages of scripture, but an ongoing, ongoing self-communication, self-communication and engagement of the spirit of the living God in Christ in the affairs of women and men of our times. The question then is, what are the sources of our theological discourse? Where do we turn to? Is theology a byproduct of our inner thought process? Or does it open itself up to a close reading of the signs of the times? Now, reading the signs of the times is what Vatican II did and also invited us to do as theologians. Pope Francis has recently denounced the shortcomings of a church that is purely self-referential. And I believe that theological research and scholarship face a similar risk. That is, to become insulated and resemble, for lack of a better term, a gentleman and ladies club. At its core, I believe, it is in the nature of theological scholarship to adapt to changing situations, circumstances, and context. I do believe that our vocation as theologians ceases to be relevant when it becomes discourse for the sake of argumentation and disputation, or when it becomes obsessed, obsessed with repetitive and deadening orthodoxy especially when it neither affects nor reflects real life situation. To read the signs of the times equips us with fresh tools. 
but help us to understand the faith and its implication for the community and for society. To perform this task with credibility and integrity, I believe that we must strive to avoid the temptation to lend our service to the tyranny of elitism, fundamentalism, and rigid orthodoxy. So, and this is my third reason for the story of Mama Frankie, our research is eminently about the faith and the life of the people of God. Now, one may object, and I would, ad I would accept that, one could object that advancing this line of thinking risks instrumentalizing the discipline of theology as if to premise its worth solely on a utilitarian criterion. Perhaps there are grounds for sustaining this kind of objection. But to say that theological scholarship and research has a concrete use or makes a tangible impact, I don't think necessarily that that is a bad thing. If theology lacked application, what rationale would we adduce for our presence here at KU Leuven? The key point then is that our theological research and scholarship, I believe, must strive to make a difference in church and in society. Because theology as a discipline is grounded in the realities of life. I've written in Theology Brood in an African part that Professor Maya refined, referred to that theology is not an exercise in, in conceptual weightlessness. But as a discipline, its method, its focus, do not defy the law of gravity. They have to be grounded in reality. Our writing, scholarship, and teaching must seek to bring a measure of coherence to the chaos and crisis prevalent in our world today, whether it's migration, intolerance, inequality, family life, etc. And I admit that what I'm saying, to a large extent, is nothing new. We have the methodology of liberation theology as a living testimony to the task of, re of theology as reflection and praxis. And this brings me to the issue of thesis writing. My guess is that the Junior Scholars Conference is for students in various stages of doctoral research. I think I could be fairly right in making that assumption. It wasn't too long ago, as I thought about it, that I too was in the throes of proposal writing and comprehensives and thesis writing. As some of you may have discovered already, this can be a very lonely task and a solitary path. But it's important to remember that we form part of a larger academic community. And this is a community that thrives on conversation, exchange of ideas, and a shared commitment of service of faith and the people of God. And it's my hope that this last conference will offer each one the opportunity to catch a glimpse of the richness, the diversity, the variety of the community to which we belong as theologians. And another point that I would like to mention, oftentimes when it comes to writing, 
a thesis or dissertation. We agonize over writing the perfect thesis. As one wise professor told me years ago in my own struggles, you never finish a thesis. You just abandon it. <laughs> now, the wisdom here for me is that writing a thesis is not an attempt to engineer the end of knowledge. Think of it this way. We all know what became of scholars in the past who deluded themselves in thinking that they and they alone held the key to knowledge. A doctoral dissertation gives us a license. What we do with the license is what matters the most. Now, some people will be content to display a huge frame diploma in a well-apportioned office. Others, for example, the thrill and satisfaction for them would come with prefixing one's name with the word doctor or suffixing it with the word, with the term PhD. Either way, I would say, what a waste of a valuable license. If it came down to a diploma on the wall or a title before and after our names. With a license, I believe that the goal always should be to be on the road, making a journey of faith but also journeying with others, fellow scholars, people of God in church and society, and striving to make a difference. I remain convinced that the exercise of theological research and scholarship is a team sport, not a competitive sport. As a community, together we create a certain theological capital that enriches the faith and edifies the people of God. The theological vocation is at once deeply personal and communal. And the faith that we deal with it's a living faith. I know that there are magisterial documents who speak copiously about the deposit of the faith handed down to us in a somewhat mechanical order, descending order. But I would prefer <coughs> to speak of a legacy, a legacy of faith. That is an ever-expanding intellectual and practical capital, a dynamic patrimony that ceaselessly questions our commitment, probes our motivation, tests our authenticity, inspires our creativity, and validates our relevance. Friends, theological research and scholarship, I believe, must become for us a path towards an experience of conversion in such a way that, to quote from the prayers of the right of ordination of deacons, we believe what we read, we teach what we believe, and we practice what we teach as theologians. At the risk of closing an address to a scholarly conference with what may sound unscholarly, I believe with Pope Francis that the impetus for theological research and scholarship is other-centered. It is centered on the other. 
It is a missionary endeavor by which, as Francis would say, we reach out to give life, hope, and love, especially to the marginalized and the impoverished materially and spiritually. And with these remarks in gratitude, I wish you all productive and an exhilarating last conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>